Uh, hello, everybody. We're going to talk to you about uh, the research we do at the University of Delft uh, in glass, and we do various aspects of this uh, fantastic material. First is we are studying on the chemical composition of glass, for we can still make major improvements on the quality, on the properties of glass. For instance, we found out that we could increase Young's modulus in a relatively easy way. And that's promising for structures, of course, because you saw the beautiful structures presented before the, our speech. And if we could have a higher Young's modulus, then all the deformations would be better. And so there are some possibilities in that. Also, we're doing research on cast glass. You can make any mold you like, pour in the molten glass, let it cool down very carefully to avoid stresses. And you can make any object, like a column, like a beam, and your uh, escape from all those restrictions you have when you have to make a structure out of plates, yeah, which can be big sizes, I know, but there are always limitations. We're also studying on the use of glass in monuments, uh, but I won't tell you much about that. But we're going to talk, Art and I, about making structures out of these uh, beautiful elements. Yeah. Glass rods, in the village rods, put in a, in a bundle to create safety by numbers and make structures of that. For if you can make a bar which can carry a, a column, a bundle column, which can carry compression and can, can carry uh, tension, then you can build any structure you like. And we built a swing, I'll going to tell you about that. And uh, if, for instance, if you look at your you see uh, the big trusses, we could make them out of glass as well. So it's a promising thing, and Arthur will tell you the technical details of that. Okay, thank you. Uh, so when I was a student uh, and uh, in Rob's lectures, he would always start, up, start, start off with this image on the left, which is from a 1950s uh, sci-fi magazine, uh, which kind of shows the vision of using glass in a structural way, in a big way, in a very, uh, let's say, spectacular way, uh, which is what really appealed to me. And uh, so now, now when I think about structures, I always think about that image, but also the image on the right. And uh, just to explain quickly, the image on the right really ties in with what Lisa was saying at the, uh, in the previous session about what glass can do. So how can we look at glass? When glass is completely transparent, we see what's on the other side of the glass. Uh, other times, glass is completely reflective, so we see what's on our side of the glass. Uh, and you know, most of the time, it's something in between. So in this painting by M.C. Escher, he really shows that you can see the fish, which, which is on the other side, and uh, the trees, which are on our side. And the water, of, of course, is synonymous with a sheet of glass. Uh, but also, very importantly, you can see the implied presence of the glass. So you don't actually see the material, the glass itself, if it's perfectly reflective or perfectly transparent. But implicit in the joints, for example, or the edges of the material, you can always see that the glass is really there. So that's what uh, Escher shows with the leaves that are floating on the glass. So you know that there is actually a physical presence there. So it's always these three things that I try to keep in mind when, when you design something with glass. So it's transparent, reflective, and also there's the implicit presence of it. Um, OK, so I will, I'll uh, explain the glass swing. I'll talk about how we came to build the glass swing and why. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about these glass bundles, so how they work technically. And then I'll also talk about these uh, steel nodes, uh, which are also quite interesting, although they're not glass. Um, so first, uh, I, I teach now a course in, uh, in, in uh, civil engineering uh, where students work with uh, structural glass and uh, teach them to design with glass and to also use it, you know, hands-on uh, cutting glass, polishing glass, and then also testing it to see like how, str how strong is it really and do the calculations really fit with reality. And so uh, for a number of years, we've been working with uh, glass provided by Schott, the, the German company, uh, and we've been developing these kind of bundles. And the students have been designing projects with them and then in the lab building projects uh, to find out what can we do with, with this material, with this extruded glass. Um, 
So we've done some student projects, and then also with the students, we've built, for example, this bridge here. And you can see that this is a, a yeah, it's called a fish belly truss structure. And the lower cord is a steel tension element. The top cord is a steel compression element. But the diagonals are made of these glass uh, bundles. And this really works, and it's been tested, and we've published it. So you can always go and, and, and look at the publications if you want to see how uh, the bundles really perform in this structure. Uh, and then last year, uh, we decided we wanted to do something very spectacular for the glass tech. And then so we, we joined up with, with SHOT again for their glass. And we joined up with Ramlab over there, who uh, are a 3D printing startup who printed the steel nodes for us. And uh, together with them, and of course, the help of a lot of colleagues, Rob Nijsen, uh, Leonard van der Linde, and uh, the rest of the team there, uh, we were able to create this uh, swing structure for the um, for the glass tech exhibition. And we wanted to do, of course, because there was already the slide uh, two years previous, so we thought it would be very exciting to try and do something that's also interactive uh, and also a playful thing to, uh, to really show structural glass as a nice and playful interactive uh, object at the glass tech. Um, so uh, previously, the, the bundles in the bridge were um, yeah, they were, they were a bundle of, of individual glass rods, and they were glued together to a star-shaped rod in the center uh, to create uh, yeah, a bigger cross-sectional area, because the second moment of area of the glued uh, cross-section is, of course, much higher than the sum of the cross uh, second moment of area of these individual glass bars. Uh, however, we found that when we were um, gluing the rods together, uh, that the rods weren't perfectly straight. So what happened was that um, the glue wasn't everywhere. And basically, for, for the structural calculations, we had to assume that uh, the, the bundle wasn't uh, one sort of cohesive unit, but they were actually, in the worst case scenario, functioning as individual rods. And then also visually, the glue, which wasn't perfectly, because the rods weren't straight, so the glue wasn't everywhere. So you could see spots of glue. So visually, it wasn't very appealing. So then we ended up deciding that it would be better to dry assemble the whole bundle. And also means that if there's damage to one of the rods, we can easily replace it. So there's these other advantages. So in the end, uh, in the swing, we've used this dry assembled cross section, as you see on the right, so without glue. And in the, in the, in the bridge project, which I showed earlier, we have this uh, glued bundle. And in the center, in the center of the bundle is a steel um, tension element, so just a steel rod that holds the whole thing together. So that's how we can dry assemble these bundles. And you don't see them here because the steel has been chrome coated, so it's very reflective. But that's just a trick to make it look as though it's a purely glass uh, structural element. But in fact, the tension force is taken by the steel rod that's running through the center of the bundle. Um, so this image just shows how the end cap works and how the whole thing is put together. Oh. Um, well, we've done a lot of tests, of course, to check what's the, what's the, the buckling load for these bundles and uh, what kind of uh, load bearing capacity can we assume for them when we design with them. And this has all been taken in, in um, in a piece of software. So we can uh, then also use different diameters for the rods to optimize the, the, sh the size of the bundles uh, for the buckling loads and for the buckling lengths of the bundles. Uh, now, this was the uh, original idea. So we, we really wanted to make something cool for the glass tech, and we didn't know what. But there was a student, uh, a master student, and he just suggested that we should make a swing. So this was his original sort of suggestion, his design. And then um, my colleague, Lennart van der Linde, he started this structural optimization process. So basically, this is the, the whole workflow. And then I'll, I'll talk you through it slowly, uh, where we kind of went from just a mass of material, so all the way on the left, kind of like a big portal, to come up with some sort of an optimized uh, structure for the swing. So it was kind of like going back and forth. So Leonard would make uh, this, yeah, this bidirectional evolutionary structural optimization. And uh, so the black bits in 
in, the, in that red image there. The black bits are the material that remains, and the red goes away. And, uh, but of course, this is not a rational structure, so this is kind of too organic to really produce out of these elements. So then we had to rationalize this. So we, we did this in 2D, but 2D in one plane, and then 2D in another plane. Okay? So we put the force, kind of like similar to a swinging person, onto this. And then we see kind of like what, where, where the struts must, must go uh, for an optimal structure. So we translate that into a three-dimensional wireframe model. So that's what you see over there. Um, and there, that's, that's just kind of like the, the engineer uh, thinking about how can we practically make this. So the computer does that suggestion over there. And then we kind of like, with our knowledge of you know, how we're going to build this and practical sort of implications of glass, uh, we decide to sort of rationalize what the computer gives us into that uh, 3D wireframe, uh, which we feel we could make. And then finally, uh, we have a cross-section optimization, which I will talk about now, now and then uh, the manufacturing of the nodes uh, to really connect all these glass bundles. Oh yeah, so this is then the computer-generated um, uh, work translated into the wireframe model. And here, um, so this is a video. Is there a way to, to play the video? Uh, Yeah. So here you see we apply the forces of a swinging person onto the wireframe structure. And uh, the Caramba, the software, gives us the, the forces in the struts. And you see that the forces uh, kind of go from, from tension to compression. Right? So if you swing this way, uh, they'll be in, comp uh, in compression and tension. And if you swing the other way, they'll flip around. So these bundles are actually loaded equally in tension and compression. And uh, with this information, With this information, we were then able to optimize the dimensions for the cross sections of these glass bundles. So you see here, uh, you see the catalog of uh, all the shot products, and then we we kind of like took seven different diameters uh, out of the catalog, and we designed the the cross section bundles with them, and then we assigned those bundles uh, to the wireframe according to the buckling length and uh, the forces on these uh, on these struts. And then here you see, so there's, there's 54 uh, bundles and, uh, and the seven different types. And the forces are all roughly 10 to 15 uh, kilonewtons, uh, both in compression and tension. And here you see the distribution of the different uh, bundles in the swing itself. So you see at the bottom there, the gray one, all the way in the corner, those are the most heavily loaded and also the longest. So they have the thickest cross section. And you see at the top there, the red, ones, the red ones are the smallest, and then the purple ones. So this optimization obviously is an exercise which is more kind of curiosity driven than really economical, because in terms of time spent, it's not really worth it. But in terms of sort of understanding how structures work and sort of thinking about it and playing with them, that's really rewarding, I think. Uh, this is now the nodes. So because, the, because of this uh, baso optimization process, we get really like tight angles between the struts. And it's quite hard to, to make this in a conventional method. And so that's why we resorted to 3D printing uh, to create these kind of complex nodes. So you can see here, it's really quite um, sort of inconvenient the way all the, all the struts come together at very tight angles. And uh, so but with 3D printing, we were able to manufacture these nodes anyways. And so this is, uh, oh, this is also a video. Right. So just to have a look at the, at the node all the way in the top of the structure, which is the, the most complex one, where the, the most struts come together at kind of tight angles. And, um, and then here, I think I'll switch on the other layers with, yeah, where the struts come. Okay. 
So this kind of optimization and the 3D printing, they obviously go very well together. So if you optimize and you want to use conventional manufacturing techniques that doesn't really match, or if you use 3D printing but you have a very rational structure, then it's also no, not really a necessity to 3D print. But the combination of these two, I think, uh, works quite well. Okay. So this is then what the nodes look like. Uh, and they look kind of organic and it's like sea monsters or like sea plants or something that grow in the water. Uh, and so this is the original idea. So how the 3D printing works is that you need uh, sort of a base material to print onto. So we have these old spheres from, uh, from the 90s when space frames were popular. You used to have these cast glass uh, spherical nodes to make space frames. And uh, Octatube, a company in Delft, they still had a whole bunch of these nodes left over. Uh, and so we, we took a bunch of those nodes and we went to Ramlop, the 3D printing company, and they were able to print the connection onto those uh, steel spheres. So here you see an exploded view of how it works. It's, uh, that's the original steel sphere, the cast steel sphere. This is the printed bit. This is an end plate that's welded onto the, that's manually welded onto the 3D printed steel. And then the, the bundle comes and it's clamped onto the end plate. And then these are just to lock it in place. Just uh, so that it doesn't slide out after. So here again, just step by step. So this is the steel uh, sphere with the printed bit. This is manually welded on, and this is how we connect uh, the glass bundle. Uh, this is the 3D printing, how it looks. So it's basically a welding robot, and it's a moving table where the steel sphere is clamped onto and they can both move so then they, the robot is free to weld wherever it wants. Uh, this is also a video. So this is the process how it looks. So basically y we give the, the geometry to, the, to RamLab, the company, and they then create the tool paths for the 3D printer. And that's, that's kind of what you see here. So this is just a dry run without uh, actual welding because we can't film and weld at the same time. And this explanation of the notes. Uh, there's also a video. So here a simulation of how the 3D printing works with, uh, with the welding robot and the moving table. And you have to like, imagine where the steel is, because it doesn't show on the computer here. And this is also a video. <laughs> so after we complete the, complete the swing, with the help of a lot of students, we built the swing at the university. And uh, here, uh, we're just testing the swing to make sure that it's safe and that it doesn't uh, deflect too much. So this is kind of still like the kind of rule of state of the, of the structure, just to make sure that, it, uh, that it's all working well. And so this is at the glass tech. So finally very happy that uh, it all worked out because it was a bit of a gamble to see if we could really do it. And finally, we also uh, kind of went on tour with this thing, just like we have it here now. We went to different uh, events to showcase. And uh, this one was uh, a New Year's party. And um, it's very nice the way, the way it's lit up with the light. So every time the light color changes, the whole structure has a different appearance. And it looks kind of sci-fi and Star Wars-like. And uh, this image I really like. <laughs> so it's a swing, but these two ladies, they're swinging, you see, below the swing. So it's kind of like it's a double, double swinging. Uh, OK, thank you very much. Are there any questions? <laughs> Hi, very, very good work. Uh, thank you. See it. Um, uh, so the question, how did you select the initial boundary, initial boundary for topological optimization? Uh, yeah. How did, you, how did you decide? Ah, OK. What, what do you want to do? Because I think, was there any reason, like, do I want to have only the compression in the supports, perhaps? Because obviously that in glass tech or in any, any exhibitions like that, right? You don't want to bolt anything to the, to the ground, right? Yeah. But I, think I, I noticed that there is an uplift, obviously. There is a tension forces in the system. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, okay. 
Well, the, any tension forces are compensated by the self weight of the structure. So there is no. There, yeah, th there's no, let's say, uplift from the foundations, if you will. Because uh, the structure itself is about 800 kilos. So you can never, I mean, we, we, sw we were swinging super hard, but there's never really any uplift. Okay, cool. Yeah. And, and then I think I noticed that you have only, do you have, did you consider any horizontal forces or not, not forces in the, in the perpendicular to the direction of the swing? Any torsion, you know, like if, if we went wild in the yeah. plastic, uh, then it was swinging in all directions. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to check, I have to check Leonard's uh, report. My, my colleague Leonard, or your colleague as well, he, uh, he did most, he did practically all the calculations. And uh, I know for a fact that he really considered this swinging motion and also the, the dynamic loads uh, that you would get. And I assume he's also checked the transverse motion. Uh, but yeah, I, I, can't, I can't speak to that right now. And your earlier question about how did we come up with the sort of the, the basic uh, outline for, for the optimization, yeah, this was also just kind of like uh, a design decision. We kind of think, okay, it has to be some, some sort of cool looking gate structure in which you swing. So we kind of start with that, and then we kind of run with what the computer throws at us, and we sort of rationalize that into a nice structure. Yeah. I'll stay on this side for the moment, but we have some time for the questions on that side. Thank you. A nice project. Um, what I really liked was uh, the 3D printing of the nodes. Uh -huh. um, I, I know it's not glass, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but uh, uh, aren't they uh, prone to uh, fatigue? Because they are not really uh, regular, so you, you have uh, pretty much notches, I would say. So. Uh, did, are there any researchers on this? Or? Yeah, so, so Ramlab, the, the company that does the, the 3D printing, they're also affiliated with the chemi uh, mechanical engineering uh, faculty at the TU Delft. And I know that they do a lot of research on this. Uh, what they, they primarily print for the maritime industry, and there they print uh, big propellers for ships. So I think they must have really looked into this fatigue issue if, they, if, if it's about propellers. Yeah. These notches, what they do is they print it and then they, they, they file it down so that you don't have any of these notches. So then I think in the interior it's actually a pretty good uh, homogeneous metal. Uh, but yeah, you, you would have to look on their website I think for, the, for a more extensive answer on that. Yeah. Another question here in the center. I was just curious, I, as I noticed when you had it built here and you can also kind of see it on these um, lower struts that they're, some of them are twisted. Yeah. Is that just uh, an aesthetic uh, choice or is there any uh, structural reason yeah. you've chosen to do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, aesthetically we're pretty happy with the twist, but structurally it's no good. Uh, so this was actually a result of this, because um, first we had them glued together, the bundles, and then of course they can resist a torsional deformation. But then once we s sort of s switched over to this dry assembled method, then we, we started having trouble with bundles that were twisted. One, when you assemble, you, you turn the nut and then in some cases the whole assembly will twist. And structurally this is bad news, so we, we try to prevent this and also we got a well, we, we actually we learned a great deal, and there's a number of improvements that we have to really try and make happen before uh, we can really make this uh, maybe a proper building system one day. Uh, but but in any case, the twist is structurally it's not good. Yeah. And a question here on the front side: uh, How many kilonewton pre-stress do you have in such an element? And um, the second question, so when does it start to buckle, which is depending on the length, of course. Yeah. But let's say for a two meter element, so when does it start to buckle, maximum load capacity? Uh, okay, so the pre-stress, the, the tension, maximum tension force uh, we calculated was about 10 kilonewtons, so we put a pre-stress of 15 kilonewtons on these bundles. And the maximum buckling force well, we've, t we've tested a bunch of them, but they were all different, so I have to, like, we, we haven't tested a two-meter member, like you said. Or, or actually, my, my, my colleague Fedra has, but that was a, um, a bonded uh, unit. For, uh, I can tell you what we've assumed in the calculations, which is that if we, if we take a bundle like this, we, we take the sum of, of the um, buckling force of two of these rods, and we take that to be sort of the... Safety factor, yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Any other questions at this point? Yes, one more. Uh, how are the nodes connected to the steel ball? You just printed on the steel? Yeah. You, you mean, how is the 3D printed part yeah. connected to the cast st steel? Yeah. Uh, so this was also a little bit of trial and error because uh, the 3D printing company, they want to know what kind of steel this is. Okay. And uh, so we go back to Octatube and we ask them, what, what steel is this? And they're like, yeah, we don't know. Like space frames, we built them in the 90s. And then when th at that time, they ordered a whole bunch of these nodes from India, cast steel nodes. And now like that company maybe doesn't exist anymore or something. But anyways, we were unable to find out what the steel quality was. So the, the Ramlov, the printing company, they had to do a bunch of trial and error with the temperature settings and the speed of the printing to make sure that the printed part adheres nicely to the to the cast uh, steel sphere. Uh, so this was trial and error, and uh, at some point they got it right. And with those settings, the rest of the notes were made. Thank you. Good. Final question. So just one more. Um, what was the uh, interface between the end of the glass rod and the steel end plate? Yeah. Um, OK, so in this case, we used MDF, like just simple, uh, yeah. Cheap MDF, and uh, but in in other projects we've also been using uh, POM, P O M, which has been pretty good. And we also tried rubber, which was bad. Uh, so we've tried a bunch of different things. So for this for the swing now it's MDF, but obviously uh, POM would be a better uh, choice, I think. Yeah. With that, I would like the to thank the audience for the very lively discussion on a Friday afternoon. All of the speakers of uh, this part of the session, give them one more round of applause. Hi there. Did you like what you just saw? If you did, why don't you like the video, drop us a comment below, and share the video as well, since GPD is all about sharing. And to receive more videos in future, subscribe to this channel and don't forget to click the bell icon. Ciao!